So welcome everyone to 22 Minutes in Lending. I'm your host, Vince Passione. I'm excited to introduce our guest, Jeff Kessler, president of Dallas-Fort Worth at Veritex Community Bank. Since joining Veritex in 2010 as its second employee, Jeff's been instrumental in driving the bank's success story. He oversees the bank's loan operations, as well as helps to develop new lines of loan businesses, including SBA lending, equipment loans, and asset lending. Jeff's impact extends far beyond the boardroom, from launching the Thursday Thought Series on LinkedIn to establishing scholarship funds for aspiring banking professionals. Thank you, Jeff, for being here today, and welcome to 22 Minutes in Lending. Yeah, well, thank you, Vince. Glad to be here with you. Awesome. So excited about the segment. Uh, so a little research on my part. So Veritex Bank, Community Bank, headquartered in, in Dallas, Texas. I think I got that right. Founded yes. in 2010 by your, your CEO and chair, Malcolm Holland. And you guys actually completed an IPO in, in 2014. Uh, bank currently is approximately 13 billion in assets. You've grown both organically and through acquisition. And from what I can tell, reading through the press releases, it looks like it's about seven acquisitions since your funding. That's correct. Awesome. So you were there at the start. You were right there, second employee. You had a seat at the table. You helped structure this. You helped really drive it. So was this intentionally built as a bank to do acquisitions? And that was the growth strategy. Tell us the backstory. Yeah, well, thank you. you know, fascinating story. Uh, our CEO and chairman, uh, Malcolm Holland, uh, coming out of the Great Recession in 08 and 09. Uh, in the United States, there was a handful of banks failing a month in the country. And uh, it was his idea and vision to build an organization that's very simply based on relationships, uh, truth, integrity, and transparency. So it was values-based. It was about serving others and building an impact. And so we sought out, uh, raised capital, Started with four people uh, in an office, probably smaller than the one you're in today, uh, in sharing desks and and resources. So, what was a vision and a dream? Uh, we were fortunate enough to raise capital from uh, people within the community across Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, that supported us. We shared that vision. Uh, people thought that uh, we were a little bit of a salmon swimming upstream, given what was going on in the industry. But we felt it was a great time to do so uh, when banks were so internally focused on challenges they were having. Uh, we were going to take healthy banks, uh, both through M&A, uh, but also growing organically. Again, going back to relationships where we begin believe is the beginning of how banking services start, right? It's me knowing you, listening, learning about what your challenges are, and seeing how I can find a way to serve you in the way you want to be served. So very uh, basic premise. Now, Jeff, not to interrupt you, but this is 2010. This is the shadow of the Great Recession. This Yes, is it is. This is the Healthcare Reform Act, the, the creation of the CFPB. This is all happening around the same time, right? So this was a good time to start a bank? Yes, it was. Uh, you know, the the results kind of... Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. The Speak for themselves. Yeah. You know, that it was. And, and here would also happen in the banking landscape. So, you know, banks, a lot of times are started by entrepreneurs that are built to be sold at a certain asset size. And so a lot of banks in Texas had been started in the early 2000s. And so that leadership team and, and capital and, and equity base had become a little fatigued in going through the Great Recession, right? And so what their business model was to build something to sell, ours was to build a bank about impact and building it a brick at a time. And so we were able to take good new capital, inject it into banks that might have been fatigued from a leadership or an equity standpoint, they had clean balance sheets, assimilate them together with a great culture. We wanted to be an acquirer of choice. So that gets into the people and culture we go about it, but then also be able to have capital to take business from other organizations that were so internally focused, they weren't even serving their best clients. So it actually turned out to be a great time uh, in history to start a bank. So now talk about the structure. So you have a bank, you have to operate a bank. And then you're going out almost acting like a P firm where you're acquiring banks. So you have to do due diligence. Then you need to turn around and close those deals. You've got to integrate this. How do you structure to make sure you're optimal in both operating the bank as well as being an acquirer of other banks? And, and it looks like you've acquired banks as well as some other companies that are processors or fintechs. Yeah. Yeah. We've acquired two uh, non-bank uh, companies uh, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, one part we always thought uh if we had built something right that was able to operate organically with a good culture okay just serving clients and bringing in new business that that actually enables and makes 
MA more likely because the talent and people can see that there's a future ahead there, but it's simply not just an acquisition of assets. It's not just an income play. It was really about continuing to grow the value of both organizations and that both together, together were better than one independent of the other. Now, have they grown in size? I mean, I, I went through some of the press releases, but it, it, has that been sort of part of the methodology is to keep increasing asset size or, or is it geographic? How, how, does, how does the strategy work when you think about your acquisitions? Yeah, uh, multi-pronged uh, there. Um, originally, it was one to create a foundation with a strong bank. So that was really the focus of the first one uh, that had a good mix and concentration of mm -hmm. both on the asset and liability side. And we found that in our very first acquisition and so thankful for that. Uh, from there, it was finding like-minded community banks, which typically have a similar mix and composition. You mentioned going public in 2014. Um, that was not uh, originally part of what we thought we were going to do, but oh. many of the organizations that started as, as uh, private had wanted to not take another private stock, but rather have a public currency. So if they wanted to sell, they could. And so by doing so uh, with our investment bank, uh, that enabled us to acquire some larger organizations, which the largest two uh, were in late 17 and then into uh, 19, 2020, which were larger banks. And so, yes, they have grown uh, in size of what we've acquired. That is part of it for scale uh, and spreading cost over a larger asset base. But also it was focused on geography, as you mentioned, when we entered another area of the Dallas-Fort Metroplex, as well as talent and or specific disciplines like SBA. Uh, that was a discipline we picked up when we made an acquisition back in 2015. Uh, and then most recently, uh, an acquisition that we had uh, of North Avenue Capital uh, was also about that, right? A mm -hmm. business that was complimentary, that we brought their expertise into our balance sheet, right? And it was very, again, complimentary uh, and, a, and a great marriage. Hmm. And you talk a lot about your values, right? You talk about truth, you talk about integrity, you talked about transparency, and I think your name, right? It's 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 sort of Veritex, but I guess it's Veritas and Texas, right? It's sort of that's how you, what Veritas meaning truth, I think. So, yeah. so how do you maintain the culture when you're acquiring all these banks and uh, non-banks, they have their own culture. So what's the what's the recipe to integrate not just the people, but also getting the culture to sort of be the same? Yeah, that would that would probably be uh, part of the secret sauce, uh, as they say, to, to to use that term. It's really about intentionality. Uh, it's about listening uh, and learning and being open to understand mm -hmm. that while those are our values that are they're, they're not negotiable, how we do things or how we might go about something is if there's a way we can refine a process from a company that we acquired or new employees. Right. That's really what's built this company to be so great from a foundation to continue to refine and learn from one another. And when you do that, you can sit across the table from one another and you have a common interest, right? That's based on values and serving others. And when you're aligned, you can walk through that. And I think it gives you a, a much greater chance or opportunity of that culture surviving and also people just not adapting, but adopting it and owning it themselves. Yeah. So so we saw mergers and acquisitions slow down. For the past four years, we saw about 400 banks a year. And in the last year, 2023, it slowed down to about 100. So yeah. how did that affect your your strategy when it comes to looking at prospects to acquire? Yeah, well, that the event that occurred, you know, was March of 2023 mm -hmm. with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, right. We all know that. Uh, I've heard you know, someone mentioned the other day, it was truly probably the first digital bank run that we've seen. Uh, where mm -hmm. people could quickly and vastly move money like they've never seen before. You know, we've seen days of old where there's lines out banks and people looking to deposit. Well, this happened in minutes on phones and digitally and apps. So some of the things we've used to serve have done that. So that event uh, singularly changed it along with the culmination, you know, the uh, rise in interest rates. Um, put the focus back on granular funding base, which means deposits or deposits that are uh, very sustainable, that aren't mm -hmm. real volatile, right? right? So again, it goes back to granularity. So that became the focus combined with the fact that when interest rates went up, the banks had either held a higher loan to deposit ratio 
or a lower one, right? Meaning their what percentage deposits were of loans. And so organizations that may have had excess liquidity invested that into securities and a bond portfolio. Some of those bond portfolios and, and CFOs went out rather long in duration. And when rates went up, the value of those bonds came down. And so you actually have, while you don't mark to market today, in the case of M&A, you would. You'd have to realize those. Ah. And that reduces equity. So therefore, that is a prevents, really, while conversations, I believe, in the industry are going on, and we will see it return, until that is resolved or rates not only stabilize, but maybe come down, the only way for that uh, adjustment in the bond portfolio to return is either rates coming down where the bonds are valued more or to solve it with equity. And so that is naturally uh, preventing a lot of the, the M&A at the historical levels that we've seen. No, it's obvious, right? I missed that, the mark to market and yep. uh, music yep. stops, right? And and you've got to realize it. Interesting. Very interesting. So let's talk about deposits. You touched on it a little bit and we all know the deposit story, right? We saw what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Almost fifty billion dollars disappeared in probably less than six hours. Um, and I was looking at some research. I was I was putting together a presentation on deposits, and S and P Global had this interesting chart. And basically, what it showed was industry cost of funds were about fifty nine basis points back in Q three of twenty twenty two, and they jumped to about two hundred eighteen basis points yeah. by the third quarter of twenty twenty three. And deposit betas are still really, really high right now. And people are concerned mm -hmm. about cost of funds and impact on them. Now, from what I, I read and heard on the earnings call, you know, Veritex started an initiative back in Q3 2022 to focus on deposits. And you kind of slowed loan growth, which made sense. Uh, the result's pretty impressive, right? You, your, your deposit growth was like $1.2 billion in 2023, which is, I think, was almost 13%. And you brought down your loan to deposit ratio to like 93%. And I heard right. your CEO say, hey, our future by the end of the year is we want to be at like 90%. So what strategies did you deploy to get those 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 deposits? I saw a white paper on Mantle. Was, was this part of your strategy? Yes, it was. Uh, Vince, you've done a you've done a great job uh, in research and Veritex and our company and and understanding the things that uh, that we've been doing. And so Mantle for us, which we started in late 22 and even years before that, and some other things that we're doing in process, refinement, uh, refinement uh, and continually improving, Mantle was part of that. And so come March, and here we were with a place that we could go out digitally and acquire clients and deposits. And we acquired more clients in that environment, in the most challenging environment we've probably seen, right, in 14 years, perhaps in part mm -hmm. of the history of the bank. And we're able to do that because that technology enabled it. We had to work to tell our story digitally, what that was like in sourcing those clients in markets where we've established a brand in Texas, where primary our, our, our footprint is, is in Texas. We had to be able to tell that story so that it resonated, no matter how well we've done that in the markets where we have physical footprints. And so both a digital campaign of awareness uh, through brand and through some of the things we do in investment in communities, and then actually apply the technology to where someone could you know, open accounts with us. And so, uh, again, thankful that we've invested ahead of time of a need and anticipation that it may come. And it just happened to be that both the economic events that occurred and that technology uh, overlapped at just at just the right time for us. Yeah. Now I won't ask you to forecast where you think rates are going to be, but but talk to us a little bit about your view on cost of funds. Uh, I, I mean, when you talked about SVB and the world's really changed, right? Consumers can move money very very quickly. Um, it's questionable what betas will look like in the future. Where do you see this settling out for for the industry as far as you know deposit betas and cost of funds? Do you think they ever go back to where they were? You know three, four years ago, or do you think this is the new normal and we're settling into it now? Yeah, well, when you had a, 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 a kind of a zero rate interest environment uh, right? with so low cost of funds, a lot of companies were built during that time and that growth. And so when rates go one way or another, you, you get to find out who has a sound business plan and vision and, and what is truly scalable. Uh, for banks, clearly uh, outside of 
uh, employee cost and benefit cost, interest cost, right, is 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 it? Um, you know, very simply, we're entrusted with the deposits of our clients. We in, in fact take and and turn and invest those back into the community, right? Form of mortgages and projects and, and new credit facilities for manufacturing companies, so on and so forth, that that creates jobs. Uh, so while rates have gone up on the loan side, all right, on the asset side. So is the betas, right? The deposit beta on the other side gone up and it's gone up significantly. So a headwind uh, is not only the deposit mix and concentration of your funding, funding mix, but also the cost of it. Uh, and so that's putting pressure on banks as far as a net interest margin goes. We continue to think that we'll see that uh, for some time, for some time. No, agreed, agreed. So we talked about funding costs, but you also have other expenses and reducing those expenses, especially now have to be really, really fo focused. You have to be really focused on it. So let's talk about fintechs, right? People throw that around all the time and say, Hey, this is a potentially a solution for creating more operating efficiency. So how does Veritex, how do you view fintechs and how do you view them either helping or potentially hurting your community banking business? Yeah. It's it, fascinating. Um, you know, various conversations that we've had, you know, amongst the executive teams going back a couple of years uh, now ranged from, you know, what is it? What is banking as a service? You're seeing a lot of articles now. Is it good or bad? How does it impact the industry? Uh, are fintech companies going to be the future of banking? Or are they going to take all the clients away? Do you need brick and mortar? All the things. The fact is they have to be embraced and it needs to be complementary to one another. So, the fintech space, which does a great job of serving people how they want to be served and acquiring clients, is not akin to the regulation and the governance and the risk management practices that banks are. Right. And that has really been a roadblock for more things working between fintechs and banks. And on the other side of that is banks. It's been the mindset because mindset for most banks is more traditional and is not will is willing to be innovative. Right. And you have to be innovated within the guardrails of risk and government. Right. So mm -hmm. putting those together, there's been some banks that have figured it out that are doing some fantastic things. Uh, most of that, honestly, has been banks less than 10 billion dollars in the U.S. that have been a little bit more innovative in approach. Uh, you must be wise here in that and ensure while they can help you acquire clients that the appropriate risk and governance procedures and controls. Right data security, cybersecurity, that that is also there. So it's putting both of those worlds together, but when they complement and the team and the management teams can align there, while there's both a little bit of adjustment, you'll see some, some win and victory, but we're embracing it. Um, we're trying to work to find more solutions every day. Uh, and you look at many of them to, to find a few. So which of the areas you're focused on? Because you hear everybody lines up when they hear AI these days, right? It doesn't matter whether it's machine learning, generative AI. People just seem to say, oh, my board said I should have a solution here, so I'm going to look for one. But are there are there verticals that you have interest in when you think on the technology side, like using robotic process automation or 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 machine learning? Or, you know, we talked about account opening, which it sounds like you're well underway. You've been at it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we've done that on the, the account side mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, you know, internally, what we've looked at is many processes are manual when you start a company and you put them together. So as you look to invest and continue to grow uh, and scale specifically, I think, as you ask most CEOs in America, when you speak to them, they always want to be twice as big as they are today. Always seems to be the answer. And so what processes are scalable, the old manual process and by putting more talented people in place? It'll get it done, but we have to find solutions. So machine learning, uh, that has been fantastic to use it um, or data capture so that data is only input one time and it comes through mm -hmm. uh, or loan documents is an example. There's a lot of companies out there doing it today where it's learned and it can be appropriately document filed in the respective places within the bank or departments. And so you're removing uh, that people need there, which allows you, this is interesting, to take and realign those people where people are needed in the process. No, no, we resonate with that statement. We often describe our business as a tech-enabled services company. Yeah. Um, and awesome. uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting, right? Because without without the people, 
um, you know, you lose connection with the customer. And I think that's, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly about that. So Jeff, last takeaway. So three things you're excited about coming down the pike. What are they? Yeah, great. Uh, one, uh, it's, it's the future of this industry for the talent that we're developing. Very excited about that um, to see what those bankers will do years beyond my tenure, right, in my era and stewardship of leadership within banking. I think that is great. Next, the uncertainty of the industry. The uncertainty of the industry. Uh, that excites me. Uh, it allows me to build, to create, to find solutions and to work with people that are as curious to be innovative within the confines of working in a highly regulated business. Uh, I believe that is a major key to success of the banks from today and those that go forward uh, or whether or not are acquired um, that's there. Uh, and, and finally, uh, it will be the continued building of the brand uh, of our organization uh, as we've built it today across Texas uh, and we expand into new markets is being able to tell our story, tell why we started this bank, uh, why we want to serve others and serve them how they want to be uh, served. Uh, it, it is an honor. It's a blessing to be able to do that and to be entrusted uh, with the resources of others. And uh, that, and along with my team, uh, we're very excited about the future. Now, look, we'll leave it there. It's a great story. Uh, so congrats on your success. Uh, Thank you. I really appreciate the time today. It was really I appreciate the insights and hearing the backstory behind uh, the research, but it is a, is a great story. So thank you. Uh, thanks to our listeners for a lot tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe so you can enjoy future episodes. And I'll meet you back here for our next 22 Minutes in Lending. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Vance. Thank you for listening to the 22 Minutes in Lending podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. You'll find links to any resources mentioned in the show notes. If you're enjoying our show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star review.